If you're going to smoke, we ask you to please be away from any buildings. Please be respectful as we are guests of the church. Also, if you have any announcements in between speakers, please see the group secretary. Group secretary, please raise your hand. All right. Danielle will now read the traditions. Hi, my name is Danielle. I'm an alcoholic. These are the 12 traditions. One, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. Two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in all of our group conscious. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Three, the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Four, each group should be an anonymous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Five, each group has but one primary purpose to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Six, an AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, less problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Seven, a free AA group ought never be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Eight, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Nine, AA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those that they serve. Ten, Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. Eleven, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. Twelve, anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all the traditions, reminding us to place principles before personalities. And Brad will now do the chips. Brad, Brad. <laughs> uh, I'm Brad, I'm an alcoholic. These chips are uh, representing uh, lengths of sobriety. Our first one is uh, one day. It's white. Is there anybody that has one day? Wants to try this way of life? Steve and Damien, everyone. All right, we have uh, two months. Yeah. Sorry, that's one month. Yeah. That was Justin and Dave. All right, uh, is there anyone with uh, three months? 90 days. Uh, let me go back to one month. Anyone who's been uh, sober for one month? Okay, well. Let me move to the other side. Okay, what about 90 days? <laughs> All, right. All right. Do you have anybody with six months? <laughs> All right, we have uh, nine months. Anybody been sober for nine months? And we have one more for a year, multiple. That was Keenan. Give everyone a round of applause, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Brad.
All right, congratulations to everybody that picked up chips. At this time, I would like to introduce Kim. the format. Harry me in. My name is Kim D and I am an alcoholic. Um, tonight I have the honor and the privilege of giving um, my sponsee Monica her snow globe for six years of continuous sobriety. Very much like the rest of us, she doesn't like to do what she's supposed to do, um, but she does it anyways because she knows that it's a matter of life or death. And um, we have been working for about a year and a half, two years, something like that, and um, it has been a joy to get to know her. Um, she works her program, and she is getting one of those lives beyond our wildest dream dreams in the fourth dimension of existence. And she's um, doing a lot of things outside of the program as a result of being in the program. And I'm very proud of her. Hi, Monica. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Monica. Um, I just want to say congratulations to those of you that came up here and just picked up tips, uh, especially those of you in the first year. Um, this is an amazing gift, and it has given me amazing gifts. And, you know, and I've been thinking a lot, you know, actually last month <laughs> was my um, anniversary month, but I wasn't here to celebrate. Um, but, you know, I've thought about a lot of, about what sobriety means to me today as opposed to six years ago. And six years ago, it meant not drinking. And today, it, it just doesn't really have to do with not drinking. Um, it's emotional sobriety. That would be the thing that I think I've discovered after, af over the past few um, years. And, um, and I've accomplished that um, by working with that sponsor and doing it when I didn't want to do it. And, and it's still, she knows, it's still tough sometimes. But, you know, I do it, and for me, the most important part of this is my spiritual program that I have today, that I have a relationship with um, a power greater than myself that I never knew possible, and I found it through these steps, and I found it through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it has been an amazing journey, and um, I really want to encourage anybody that's new or feels like giving up, you know, one day it's not going to be about the drink anymore. One day it's going to be about the blessings and being able to look back and see how amazing your life can become. And it has truly been amazing. So um, having said that, I want, actually she was just up here, but um, I asked my sponsor to speak tonight because um, she, she's been in uh, many of the steps that I'm in now and that I've been through. And she's been amazing. <sighs> Just and as an example, and just to you know, see such a strong woman of sobriety be able to just like take on the world and raise a kid and go to school and and do all of these things that all of these gifts that are just byproducts of of this program. Um, so uh, I don't want to talk anymore because I want to hear her story. Um, Kim. I'm a little nervous. Um, my name is Kim D, and I am an alcoholic. Um, my sobriety date is October 6th of 1992, so um, I'm very excited this month because I'm celebrating 20 years of continuous sobriety. Thank you. And I remember at the conference last summer, I can't remember the name of the speaker, it was the um, older woman from New York, and she said... Um, I am only me because of you, and that is the truth, because without Alcoholics Anonymous, I would not be who I am today, and I am so, so grateful for that, 
And I just hope, you know, you th I was thinking today about what I was going to say and, and how do you express it? How do you talk about that spiritual awakening um, in order to recover? It's a very hard thing to describe. But um, it has definitely happened to me, and I just hope that I can show you how bad it was and how great it is today because my life has just been turned upside down by this program. Um, you know, just by the fact that I can stand up here and speak to you is a miracle. Um, when I was little, I'm just going to share this, and, and I have some real situations that it, it's just mind-boggling to me how I have changed as a person. When I was a small child, I could not speak in front of people. I was the kid who would fake illness to not have to go to school and speak in front of other people. I did it all through high school. When I was in college, I can remember leaving for break early so I could avoid having to speak in front of people. I can remember coming to conclusion one day in college that if I had vodka and orange juice before I went to speak, it would probably work. And I did that. And I just, to, for me to even stand up here today is a miracle. And I'm able to do it because I've been able to put myself aside and realize that this really is not about me. It's about us. It's about Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's about me being able to carry a message of a blessing that God has given me. And um, so I'm going to tell you in a, um, in a um, general way what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today. And, um, and I also want to say my home group is the Westminster, um, set, what is it, the Westminster Wonderful Saturday Morning Step Meeting. Yay! Very cheery group. And, um, I, and actually, if you were coming to hear Kim from Eastlake, I really apologize, but she doesn't exist. <laughs> they thought my home group was Eastlake. It was a while ago. Um, and this is a great meeting. I love this meeting because this is a very traditional Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Yeah. The guys are suited up in their ties. The ladies are dressed up. I knew if I didn't get dressed up tonight, Dan Lanahan was going to have a word with me. So I made sure I did what I was supposed to do. But it's really awesome, and it's very traditional, and, it, and it's important that we respect what has been given to us. So um, I like that. Um, what it was, let me see. I was born in, um, and I'd like to say that I was 10 when I got sober, but I was not. Um, so <laughs> I'm approaching that big 5-0, but um, I, I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I got sober in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I was born to two untreated adult children. Um, those were my parents. Um, I can say today that I absolutely love my parents. They were wonderful people. You know, they gave me everything that they had. For a long time, I, I despised them. I thought they, they, were the pro they were the problem. I thought they caused my problems. And um, it, so it was a really, um, it, was a, it was a sort of a suppressive upbringing, if I can say that. Um, I just remember, although there was no active alcoholism, there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of anger. There was a lot of dysfunction. There was no spiritual program or path or anything whatsoever. Um, it was just kind of, just a lot. Of, I just remember being very afraid all the time. And... Um, Today, and I remember, and none of my material is original because I've heard it all in meetings, but I can remember somebody saying, the longer I stay sober, the better my childhood was. And that is really true for me. Um, I have a great relationship with my parents today, and I love them to death. And when I walked into AA, I hated their guts to the core of their being. And everything has changed because I have changed. Um, so I grew up in that household, and when I got to the age of 13, I just was a mess. And, you know, I was very self-centered way before I started to drink. I was always having trouble with relationships. I could never get along with people. I could never get along with the other girls. You know, that whole mean girls thing, people would be after me, I'd be after them, stealing boyfriends, doing all this stuff, and always making decisions based on self that put me in a position to get hurt. And I did that over and over again. And I remember, and I'm no different than a lot of people, the night I found alcohol, my life changed. It was the solution. Because I just felt like just horrible all the time and just didn't fit in and just didn't feel comfortable. And I remember that night, um, and I always share this story because I think it's quite 
humorous, but there was four of us on a case of beer in the woods. And I was, I, I was 13, and I remember drinking, and I remember throwing off my shirt and having this guy chase me into the woods. And I, I will never forget that. You know, it was like this freedom, this feeling of, wow. And, um, and I say, you know, that's how it went for the next, you know, 20, 18 years. I got drunk, I took off my clothes, I ran, people chased me. But, um, you know, and you're laughing because you know what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, I can laugh about that today. And I believe what they say in the big book, that my deepest, darkest past has become my greatest asset. It doesn't have any meaning to me anymore. I'm over it. And it has taken me a long time to get over it. And I can't tell you that I got over it in the first year of Alcoholics Anonymous. It took me a long time to get over a lot of that stuff and a lot of that shame and a lot of that pain. But I just keep coming back. And, you know, congratulations to the celebrants tonight. You know, I can remember a week, a day, a month, six months, nine months, you know, of the first year. And, you know, and then I stand up here tonight and I'm like, how the heck did this happen? How did it happen? I mean, when I first got sober, I couldn't, I couldn't even phantom how I was going to celebrate my 30th birthday without booze. It was, like, really freaking me out. And, um, and today, it, just, it doesn't matter anymore. But, um, but what I did, and it says this a lot in the big book, because I never knew the first drink was the problem. Um, I just never knew that the first drink was a problem. The only thing that I have done absolutely correctly in the last 20 years is I have not picked up a drink no matter what, no matter how upset I was, no matter how angry I was, no matter how depressed I was, no matter how happy I was and how successful I was, the only thing that I did was not pick up the first drink. And that is what got me to 20 years. And, um, you know, Monica talked about emotional sobriety. I mean, that is what it's really all about because I know for me, and I've done it before, um, and I start to take that little sabbatical away from AA, and very quickly, my emotional state deteriorates, very quickly. And, um, and then I get back to that, you know, woe is me and poor me and depressive state, and before you know it, that's what leads you to the drink. So it's really important to maintain that emotional sobriety. So anyways, um, let's see, where was I? Um, the guy in the woods, okay. Um, pretty much drank all through high school, drank all through college. Um, it wasn't too, too bad in high school because I kind of maintained because I had those suppressive parents that were on my back. And by the way, I'm an only child, so that's like strike two. Um, so I had all that on top of me. Um, and I, um, you know, when I got to college is when it really, really got bad because there was nobody watching my back, nobody asking me why I wasn't coming home. I was like a free for all. And I went there for, I went off to college for a two year major. I was having so much fun, I changed it to a four year major. And I just <laughs> literally maintained by the skin of my teeth. I graduated with some, I think it was like a, I don't even know, right over a 2.0. Barely, and that was cheating, like getting stuff from the sorority house or the fraternity house and doing whatever I had to do to survive to get those grades so that I could stay in school and party because that's what I really wanted to do. And um, I did that, and, you know, I can really share at the end of my college, I will never forget this, and these are all, again, those miracles. You know, I went to college, and I barely maintained a 2.0. When I went to graduate school about six years ago, I got a 4.0. Okay, these are the differences between sobriety and drinking. My life is completely different. And I can remember as a senior in college, I can remember I had so much shame, so much shame. And, I, and it was a very small Catholic school, and everybody knew everything. And everybody knew who I was, and they knew my reputation. And it was incomprehensible demoralization. And I can remember going to class and I can remember going a back alleyway, sneaking up the back stairs, sneaking back down, and going back home and hiding because I couldn't face anybody sober. I had to have those drinks before I headed to the frat house so that I could be comfortable in my skin before I got there. So during class, I couldn't even walk the streets. And I was very aware when I was at USF that I could walk in the front door. I was very aware of that. And that was very different for me. I had lost that shame. And, you know, those of you who know that internal shame, that's huge to have that be on. So um, I finished off college. I, and it's funny, I have to share this quick story about college. You know, I, it's funny. I was at a Catholic college, and I remember thinking, well, I think my problem is I need to be Catholic. 
okay? Because I'm drinking all the time, and I, my roommates are coming home, and I'm thinking, I need to be Catholic. That's the solution. And then that whole confession thing sounded really good, because then I could do what I wanted to do, go to confession, and everything would be okay. And, um, and I converted to Catholicism at the height of my drinking in college. And I can remember, I mean, literally had my first baptism with my roommates, had a cake party in my apartment. I mean, it was just like the Catholics. And I remember going to this priest every week, every week, and I would have, and it was this cycle. And I would go in and I would say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I have drank in excess and I have lost control of my actions. He'd forgive me. And then I would go to like a a small church group before the, the party started. And I can remember going up to communion with all those people out there that knew what I did and say, look, I must be okay. I'm receiving the body of Christ. Look, I must be okay. And I did that over and over again. And finally, this priest looked at me and he said, Kim, you can't keep coming back and confessing (laughs) the same things every week, every week, every week. And um, at that point, I was done. I'm like, okay, out of here, you know. And I I did eventually finish it before I got into my first marriage. I did eventually become Catholic, but I'm not Catholic today. Um, But that, that was amazing to me that I saw that there was a spiritual solution, but you can't do step three before you do step one. It didn't work. So that was my experience there. So I came home, left there, geographic cure, never going back to, believe it or not, Erie, Pennsylvania. And I went back to Pittsburgh, and, um, and then I was going to get my act together. So the first solution I thought of was, what do we do when we want to grow up and finally get our act together? We get married. So I married the guy that I met in the woods when I ripped my shirt off. So it was like, perfect. And um, he and I had grown up together. And, um, you know, it was going to be awesome. We were going to get married. We did get married. The wedding night was an absolute disaster because of other substances. I mean disaster. I thought we were going to all die that night. It was so <laughs> literally out of control. And, um, and we, you know, we got married. And um, there was one point in time right after our marriage that something happened um, that I can't be real specific about. But it was really, really, really bad for a new married woman to do. And um, I remember I was in my bed in our apartment. I remember being under covers, and I called in Pittsburgh. It's Gateway Rehabilitation Center. And I said, hi, this is Kim. I have a problem. I think this is what I did last night. I think I have a problem with alcohol. And she said, well, then you need to come in and have an evaluation. And I'm like, whoa, like I'm not going in for no evaluation. Like I just wanted to resolve this on the phone. I don't know what I, I don't know what I expected her to do for me that day. I have no idea, but I hung up. And then that was really about two years before, I, two or three years before I got sober. And that started the control part. And I just want to go back to talk about that cycle of alcoholism, because this is how it has always been for me. You, you go out and you have those first few drinks with impunity, okay? This is cool. I'm going to be fine tonight. And then you pass through the stages of a spree, totally out of control, insane. Dr. Chekhov, Mr. Hyde, like resembles your normal nature but little. And then you get up the next day and you say, I will never do that again, ever, 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 ever. I'm going to change this up. I'm going to change that up. And then... Two days later, one day later, a week later. I love this line in the big book. You cannot bring into your memory the pain and suffering of only a few days ago. I'm going to have a few drinks, and it's going to be okay. And it just went on and on and on, over and over and over. And um, that is really a very painful way to live life. So um, got married, and um, I I call my child my miracle baby because um, I, I think at the time, you know, I didn't really care whether I lived or died didn't matter. We didn't even think much about that. We just went out and drank and did what we were supposed to do and had a good time and partied till we dropped and that was it. After I had her, you know, I'm very fortunate for those parents that really instilled in me some strong morals and values, even though I hated them for it at the time. You know, I had the sense of wanting to be a good parent. And, um, and a couple instances happened after I had her that really, those were those deep, dark secrets that nobody was ever going to know about. And I... Remember, um, I, and here's the other thing. We moved, my husband and I, who grew up on the same street, move across the street from two people that we grew up with on the same street. They have a bar in their basement. 
we were set, man. We weren't going to have to drive. We were set. We were going to stay on that street on Rolling Road, and we were going to party forever, and I was going to have a baby monitor, and everything was going to be fine. Because I could, could have the baby monitor up in the window. We could be out on the street having a block party. I mean, this was where my mind, this was my setup. And um, I had her, and I remember one night we were over at the neighbor's. We came home. And the next day I got up and I'm like, yo, she slept through the night. Yes. And I went downstairs and there was a bib and a bottle. And I must have gotten up in a blackout, carried her down a flight of steps, fed her and put her back in bed and didn't remember it. That was a deep, dark secret that none of you were ever going to know. I mean, that brought shame upon me that was unbelievable. And then there was another incident. We were watching a Steeler game and I forgot to strap her on her shoulder and she fell out. Those were two events it kind of changed my life. And that's when I really, really started to, to decide to drink less. <laughs> so that's where we started. The, you know, we're not going to mix drugs and alcohol. We're not going to drink hard liquor. We're not going to have this, this or that. You know, and then I started getting into the, um, the, the psychiatrist and the, and the therapist because my world was crumbling. My world was crumbling. It was all out there on the outside, but on the inside, I was falling apart. Falling apart. That loneliness that they talk about, that fear that they talk about, wanting to jump out of your skin because you can't stand yourself. I don't ever want to feel like that again. And, um, and I started going to a doctor, and he prescribed Xanax. So I'm taking Xanax, I'm drinking, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, blah, 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 blah. And that kind of was what brought me to my bottom. And um, I remember those last couple drunks that last summer, you know, I kept saying, I'm not going to do it this time, I'm not going to do it this time. You know, and then you would go to a bar. And you're going to just have one. And then they had those test tube shot glasses that you had never had. And you're like, well, this is not the night to start. Obviously, if they have this item available, you would not start drinking or stop drinking tonight. And it was just always one thing after another as to why I wasn't going to stop. And then I would go back and negotiate with this parent, this therapist. I'd be like, I only had six drinks. And she'd say, but you weren't going to have any. And I'd say, I made a conscious choice that I was going to have six. And it's okay. And she just kept letting me go and let me go. And I just kept spiraling emotionally more and more downhill. And um, I remember my last drunk and my last drink. Actually, oh, I got one thing i got to share real quick. Um, I, you know, I told you my first drink was when I was 13. But this summer, we, um, my parents celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. And we came back to the house and we watched a video, an old video. And I'm two years old. I never saw this before. I must have seen it, but I don't remember. Two years old, Duke's long neck, brown bottle. Not once, not twice, but three times in the middle of my parents' living room at two years old. And, you know, I look at that kid and I think she looks so unhappy. And I was so unhappy at that time. I just was, it had nothing to do with them. I was just an unhappy kid because of me. Um, so, you know, I, so I had my first drink when I was two, actually. But I didn't get drunk until I was 13. But, um, you know, I, where was I at? I'm trying to think. I lost my train of thought. We were at, hmm? Last drink. Thank you. Jenna's my timekeeper here. So, that last drink, I remember I went to a wedding. It was at an exclusive club in downtown Pittsburgh. And my neighbor was getting married. And her dad was the um, general counsel of the United States Steel Corporation. So, it was a big deal. They had frosty champagne glasses in the courtyard. There was no way that was the right night to stop drinking. And, you know, so I just knew it in my gut. And here I am all decked out in this beautiful outfit, and I go to this wedding, and I'm not going to drink. And I saw the glasses, and I said, not tonight. And, you know, hours later, I'm walking through the streets of downtown Pittsburgh, barefoot, in blackouts. Again, how did I get here? How did I get here? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and I remember that ride home that night. Can you my water, honey? <coughs> well, this is unlike me. I can usually talk forever. Um, I was um, in the back seat of the car that night coming home, and all of a sudden I had this feeling that I had never felt before. It quit working. It quit working. I wasn't happy. I wasn't high. I wasn't having any fun. I was just drunk. 
and it, it, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And even after that, I wasn't going to drink again. And then two years later, I was at a function. Um, I worked at a corporation in Pittsburgh, and I was at this meeting with, and I sat at the general counsel's table, and I'm like, I, not tonight. Not tonight. Even though I said it was going to be tonight, it can't be tonight. So I drank and drank. And I remember I had my last drink. It was a, a I had to have an after dinner drink. Nobody else was having after dinner drinks. I had a shot of Bailey's Irish cream. And I remember being on this 56th floor of the Mellon Bank Center with the big trophy in front of me, the Mellon Bank trophy. And I remember drinking that and it, it just, it was like a light bulb. I can't stop. I can't. I absolutely unequivocally knew at that moment, that was like my moment of clarity that they talk about in the big book, I can't stop. And that's where it began for me, and i got to keep speaking because I want to talk to the um, about sobriety, but um, that's when it stopped, and um, I went back to that therapist, and I went nuts. I mean, I was kicking chairs, I was screaming, I'm like, you don't know who I am, you don't know what I've done, you don't know anything. It was like all that crap that you just kept pushing down with the booze just all came out, all of it. And, um, well, not all of it, there was a lot of work to be done, but a lot of it came out. <laughs> and, you know, that's when it began, and I got into outpatient therapy at Gateway Rehab, and I started going to meetings, and I just felt so at home at Alcoholics Anonymous, and I shared this a couple weeks ago. There is no place on earth that I feel more comfortable than a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And after I shared that, I thought about it later, and I thought, I might not trust you with my purse, but I will trust you with my heart. <laughs> Unequivocally, you know? I, and that is a bigger deal. I trust you with my heart, my heart, because I feel like I can share anything here. I can feel comfortable here. You're all honest with me. It's, it's just a wonderful place to be, and we're all talking about the big secret that we were never going to talk about. And I came in today, and I just felt so connected and so at home and so relieved. And I went through that pink cloud for the first three years, had a couple of sponsors, worked the steps, and got up to like six or seven. And then I hit a wall that a lot of people talk about in sobriety. I hit a wall of depression because, yeah, third step, sure, I'm doing that, you know, lip service, but I'm still trying to control everything. And that has always been my problem, that I just wanted everything to be the way I wanted it to be. I, if the world would just do it like I think they should do it, everything would be okay. And so I, I'm, I'm still trying to control everything. Nothing is within my control. Everybody's doing things wrong, and I don't have that drink to give me that ease and comfort. It's a painful place to be. And I went into one of the deepest, darkest places I've ever been, and um, I ended up, I ended, and I don't know what this was about now, but I ended up in the psychiatric unit for about a week. I was checking out, and again, it goes back to, it's his fault, it's my parents' fault, it's their fault, blah, 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 blah. And I went into the psychiatric unit for a week, and I remember when I got there, I was like, oh, I don't have to cook, I don't have to go to work, I don't have to do anything. Dad, raise that kid, you know? And then, like, five days later, I'm like, oh, my God, there's crazy people in here, i got to get out. Um, but, you know, it's what I needed at the time, and I'm going to tell you right now, and I've shared this before, if your option is psychiatric unit for a week or picking up a drink, go to the psych unit. Go to the psych unit, because then there's still hope. Then there's still hope. As long as you don't pick up that drink, there's hope. The minute you pick up the drink, it's over. It's over. There's no hope. There's no spiritual growth. You're right back to where you started. And um, so I got out of the psych unit, and then I met my um, sponsor that I had for a very, very long time. This woman literally saved my life, and I love her to death. She was my sponsor for about 14 years. And I went, I, I went, actually, the night before I was out, my husband was somewhere, my daughter was at a sleepover or something, and I remember, I remember right after the psych unit, sitting in the parking lot of Al's Cafe and thinking, I want to go in. I want to go in there. But I knew that if I went in there, I was never coming out. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. And I went to my home group the next morning, and I saw the guy greeting at the door, and I said, I'm in trouble. I want a drink so bad. And he's like, then you need to mix it up. Find some new meetings. Get a different sponsor. He said, how about her? And I said, okay. So I went home, and I had known this woman for a while. She was a very, very traditional Pittsburgh steel mill sponsor and she gave no bones about anything and I met her that morning and she told me three things that changed my life completely she said number one number one you need to get off all that crap you're taking you are not depressed you are not bipolar you are not this you are not that you are an alcoholic and you need to work these steps and I'm not and please hear me I'm not telling anybody that that is your solution but that's what was true for me 
It was true for me. Number two, she says, you need to go home to your house that you live in and build a life for yourself in that house and leave everybody else the hell alone. (laughs) And that meant, and that meant it's not my parents' fault, it's not my husband's fault, it's not my kids' fault, it's not anybody else's fault. I need to work these 12 steps to get me better. They have nothing to do with this. This is an inside job that Kim and only Kim can do. And the third thing she told me that morning is she said, and you have got to find a power greater than yourself to restore you to sanity or you will never be able to stay sober. And she said, have you read the chapter to the agnostic? And I said, heck no, I believe in God, you know, and I never read it. I never read it. I skimmed right over that because I believed in God, but you know, and I can even remember those first AA meetings. And even sometimes today I get that disconnect. Um, I know, I knew that God was out there and I knew that when I was in a really bad situation, I would talk to him, but that was pretty much all the further that it went. Um, I could see, and it was almost like a little bit of a self-pity thing, like I could see God working in everybody in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, but God was never going to do that for me. And a lot of it had to do with working those steps. I had to do four and five. I had to do eight and nine. I had to clean the wreckage of the past for God to be able to get into my life. There was no way, and my sponsor used to call it the black goo inside of me, there was no way that God and the sunlight of the Spirit could have reached me with all that crap inside of me. There's no way. So when they say, you know, you take that third step, and I believe that part where it says the third step is just being honest, open-minded, and willing. You're saying, I have pretty much screwed my life up completely. Every decision I have made has landed me in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I need to start listening to other people. And I need to start taking suggestions. And I need to do what I am told. I need to do what I am told. I need to become teachable. And, um, and that's what I did. And, um, and, it is, you know, it's, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more because every time I'm like, well, that's it. And that's fine. But you know what? There's so much more after that. Um, it, you know, I continue to remain sober, sort of on a status quo. I went to, um, if anybody's ever heard of Chit Chat Farms, I went there to their um, codependency program for like a five-day inpatient um, for adult children because a lot of that stuff went on at my house. I went to that. You know, I did a lot of work on myself. Um, And I did a lot of work on the steps just trying to, you know, get better. But again, I was still in that house in the same neighborhood with the same husband. And it it was just like status quo. Nothing was happening. So there really weren't any character defects flaring. You know, I I was just kind of going along with life, going along with life, not real alive, just kind of, flatline. And what happened is we came down here to Florida for a vacation and I had a job. I was working for H.J. Heinz Company and I thought I was going to retire there because once you got there, you never left. And I was working there and I got caught up in a corporate downsizing and got put in a position that was not suitable for me as far as I was concerned. And um, and I came to Florida and we're sitting on the beach in Brandon and I'm like, let's just move to Florida. Let's just move to Florida. What the heck? There's nothing keeping us in Pittsburgh. We went back six months later, sold the house, packed it up, and moved to Florida. And, um, and that's what really started, I think, for me, my true spiritual awakening. Because for me, I had to experience a lot of fear and a lot of change for me to really throw myself into work in those steps and to get to that emotional sobriety that I had to do something. And um, so we moved down here. And, and I'm going to just go over some of those real cool... God gave me a lot of do-overs. I am so blessed for my do-overs. Um, I came to Florida, and I ended up miraculously teaching. Um, you know, I had the bachelor's degree. I had never taught a day in my life. I had never set foot in a school since high school or college. And I went to my daughter's school, and, they're like, and that's when there was a real teacher shortage. You know, and all this, like, was God planned for me. I mean, it was all just perfect timing. And they're like, well, why don't you teach? I'm like, how do you do that? They're like, oh, there's this program. You just go teach. I'm like, okay. So the next thing you know, I'm like, here's the keys to the classroom. And you shared that last week. And I'll never forget that. You were talking about it the Saturday morning meeting about getting the keys to somebody's house. Somebody actually trusting you. Oh, that's scary. I didn't know that. (laughs) Monica, I should have called you. But he said, I can't believe that somebody trusts me enough to do that. And you know what? I couldn't believe 
that somebody trusts me enough to give me the keys to the school. I couldn't believe it. Holy crap. And I started this job, and it was such a healing experience for me because when I was in high school, everybody hated me. I had a reputation. Nobody liked me. And there was stuff written on the bathroom wall by me. And it was, it was a chance to experience high school, be amongst all those teenagers, and not have anybody hate me. That was huge for me. It was so healing. And I even got to be in a pep rally one day because, you know, it was like the pep rally and all the teachers did a skit, and I was like, oh, my God, I'm here. And that might not sound like, I know if you get it, you get it. That was a miracle for me that I got to participate in that because I was out in the bleachers doing shit I should not be doing when the pep rallies were going on. Um, <laughs> trust me. I think it was men and booze. I don't know. But anyways, um, you know, I... I, it was a miracle. And then, you know, I ended up getting a divorce um, from the guy from the woods. Imagine that didn't work. Duh. You know, because, um, and he's a great guy, and he's been a wonderful father to my daughter. Um, but we came together, I would say, you know, that whole thing about two halves don't make a whole. We were broken. We were drunks. That's what we did together. And as my sobriety continued, he wasn't coming along, and it wasn't working. It just wasn't working, and I, it, it stinks that it had to end, and I hate my daughter had to go through that, but there was nothing there. Once we left that comfort zone of Pittsburgh and got away from those people, it, it just wasn't there. Um, so I got a divorce, and then right after that, I went to this meeting, and, and I have to share this because this was another God moment for me, a God moment. God has moved miracles for me. You know, I went to this meeting about this master's program, and I'm like, I'm never going to get in. I am never going to pass the GRE, ever, and I'm just going to go and hear what they have to say. And they're talking and talking. And after the meeting, I went up and I said, well, I'm not going to be able to do this. I said, my GPA was too low, and I will never pass the GRE. And they're, they're like, wait, wait. And this wasn't supposed to start until a year and a half later. They said, if you can start in January, we have a program starting in Hillsborough. And if you start right now, it's like a deal on TV, um, we can <laughs> let you in. And if you pass your per first two classes with an A, we will waive the GRE and the, and the, and the, and the GPA requirement. No kidding. I'm like, God just went, gone, gone. So now when I'm at work and I'm like, what the hell am I doing here? I'm like, God got me here. God moved mountains to get me here. And I, and I always go back to one of the things my dad said when I was growing up that has resonated with me, and I have worked so hard to try to overcome it, but you know those old tapes? They always play every once in a while. And he said something to me, and remember, my parents come from poverty, from alcoholism. And he said to me, Kim, because I was thinking about going to law school or something, he said, Kim, people like us only go so far. And every time I do something at work, or every time I get up to speak, or every time I try to move to the next level, that still is in the back of my head. But I have to call my sponsor, and I have to work the program, and I have to say that that is not my tape anymore. And I have to just walk through the fear and do whatever God has put in front of me. And he has put so much in front of me, I'm like, whoa, you know, let's slow up. But it's just been miracle after miracle after miracle. Um, my, I'm so blessed. And, you know, after that divorce and, that, and even that program, I can remember that the first day I went to that master's program, it was on Saturday. And I remember going to the USF. I literally left that class, and I went straight to the A club. And I remember going in there and saying, holy crap, I'm not stupid. I, it was like a huge revelation for me because I never thought I was going to be able to cut it and I actually handled my own. I was a nervous wreck, but I handled it. And now I can take God with me everywhere I go and I can get on my knees in the bathroom everywhere I go. And I still do it a lot at work. I did it tonight. Who said that? When I, she, I said, I need to go to the restroom. You go, you're going to pray. And, and I was, and I was. You know what it's all about. You go in there and you get on your knees and you say, thank you, God, for all the stuff that you have given me Please allow me to tell them what has happened to me and tell them that this works because it really, really, really works. Um, you know, so during that divorce, the masters six and seven had to be worked like every day. All my character defects. And another big, big, big thing for me was I am all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, single and sober. Okay? I don't know if any of you can relate to that. Okay? I know how to date drunk, but I don't know how to do it sober. And that was a real growth period for me. And I was getting back into some of those bad habits of wanting somebody so bad that I was willing to. And, you know, they, a lot of people share meetings. They say, well, my picker was broke. Our pickers are never broke. We ignore them. You know, we, our pickers are never broke. We have a God consciousness now. We know in our gut. 
But we want that relationship so bad that we make poor choices. Not that they're bad people or, you know, whatever. It's just not appropriate choices for you. And, um, and I started to get into that habit again, so I got back into some um, intensive therapy, and I also worked very hard on this program. And, um, and I was able to get past that, and I just want to say I have a wonderful husband who I just married two years ago, and um, he is not one of us. Yay! Um, Gordon, he, he does not drink. He works a spiritual program, and he doesn't even have to. Like, that doesn't even make any sense at all to me. I'm like, why? Like, if you weren't dying and you're not feeling like crap, why would you do this? But, and, I, and I will never understand that. But, you know, that's the way it is. Um, he's not one of us. And there are a lot, I'm finding as I go, there are a lot of people out there who are like him, who are seeking spiritual paths, who don't have to hit the fan like we did. You know, it's amazing to me. I was very prejudiced in that area for a long time. And I'm starting to try to be a little more open to that. So, um, you know, it's just a wonderful program. Um, I can't say enough about it. Um, I have a sponsor, Carol, and Carol has a sponsor. And that's really important because I need to know who's sponsoring me is sponsoring, being sponsored. Um, and I use these tools all the time. I call her at least twice a week with some dilemma, some situation, something that I don't know how to handle. And I don't know if you guys remember the comedian a couple years ago. You know, first thought wrong. No matter what is happening in my life, my first thought is always wrong. It is always based on self. It is always based on me getting something I want or not losing something I have. It's based on fear, whatever. And I have to, before I go into anything major with relationships or work or whatever, I have to run it by her. I have to run it by other people in the program. Bit because it, it's so funny. We've talked the last couple of days, and she keeps saying, "Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath." <laughs> I'm like, "Is there something to this? Like, why do you keep telling me to take a deep breath?" And it's like, because I get so wound up, and I got to. What did they say in the big book? Pause. I had to learn to pause before I react to those situations because my left with no AA filter, I'm a lunatic. I am a lunatic, and I will damage every relationship that I'm in, damage every relationship that I'm in. So um, I just want to share two things for you um, out of the big book, and then I'm going to be quiet. Um, I'm going to share for you where I was when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. And don't you love this book? Oh, my God. It's like the words jump off the page. This is where I was when I came in on that day after the Bailey's Irish Cream. The less people tolerated us, the more we withdrew from society, from life itself, as we became subjects of King Alcohol, shivering denizens of his mad realm, thank you, of his mad realm, the chilling vapor that his loneliness settled in. It thickened, ever becoming blacker. Some of us sought out sword places, hoping to find understanding, companionship, and approval. Momentarily we did. Then would come oblivion and the awful awakening to the face of the hideous four horsemen, terror, bewilderment, frustration, despair, unhappy drinkers who read this will understand. That is where I was when I came into AA, and this is where I am today. And I just read this story at a, bit, at a meeting a couple weeks ago. This is the story in the back that is the keys to the kingdom. This is where I am today. There is no more aloneness with that awful ache so deep in the heart of every alcoholic that nothing before could ever reach it. That ache is gone and need never to return again. Now there is a sense of belonging, of being wanted and needed and loved. In return for a bottle and a hangover, we have been given the keys to the kingdom. Thanks. Thank you, Kim. We pass the basket in accordance with the seventh tradition, which states that we be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. If you would like to become a member of this group, please see me or any other group member after the meeting. Would group members please raise your hands? If anyone is able to become a sponsor, please raise your hand. If you need a sponsor, give with a hand. But Matt C. has announcements. Evening, everybody. My name is Matt. I'm an alcoholic. 
Next week, November 2nd, we have Jerry L. from St. Pete. Oh, these are the upcoming speakers. Um, November 9th, we have Wayne B. from Chicago. November 16th, we have Toby, D. From, Toby T. from Tampa. I'm getting better at that. November 23rd, we have Annie from St. Pete. November 30th is going to be our anniversary meeting for November, and we're going to have Ann R. from Ozona. I want to welcome all the new people, people who picked up chips. If you don't have a home group yet, please stay for the business meeting tonight, and we will get you involved, we'll get you a job, and a nice home. Not like a real home, like a here. <laughs> On Friday nights, that's it. And you can call me during the week, and that's it. Literature and speaker CDs are available for a donation on your terms, or you can visit our website and download them completely for free. See me after the meeting for more information on that.